Representative Mullins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Madam Secretary, for your indulgence for a second round here. Um, wanted to uh, touch now on long-term care facilities. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, new staffing requirements for uh, nursing homes have gone into effect in recent years, and the governor's budget does not include a proposed increase in Medicaid reimbursement uh, to further assist uh, nursing homes to cover the costs related to that hiring of new staff and offering wage increases to retain current staff. Um, how is the department collaborating with DOH uh, to ensure that nursing homes are receiving the financing they need to ensure they can not only meet their regulatory obligations, but that they can help pay living wages for their uh, nursing staff? I'm going to turn to Gloria in a second, but there's been two increases for nursing facilities, 17% uh, in the, I'm going to mess this up, 22-23 budget, uh, and then an additional, I think, 2.5%, 1.8% for the uh, fiscal year that we're in. And so that 17% came early in order to allow the facilities to have the dollars to start to staff up to meet the July 1st requirements. And then um, the additional monies in this fiscal year were to cover the, I believe it's 0.2 hour additional increase uh, in that requirement that starts this summer, I believe. Um, we also have uh, our eye on federal, potential federal guidance. And this, this could potentially be impactful. Uh, it would require a registered nurse to be present 24 hours a day which is uh, not the case in many of our facilities currently. I've actually talked to a number of our facilities about this. We did send a letter to CMS expressing our concerns, particularly uh, for many of our rural hospitals where it's hard enough for them to, I'm sorry, rural nursing facilities, where it's hard enough for them to get nurses into you know, working in those facilities to begin with and what it would mean for them to have somebody 24 hours a day. There is also no recognition of LPNs in CMS's uh, proposed guidance. And so we've also lifted that up as part of the solution. So we're very uh, sensitive to this issue and we're doing everything we can from our place in this to try to make sure that our facilities stay stable. Yeah, and just to follow up, so in the 24-25, we are proposing to annualize the rate increase that went into effect January 1 of this year for the jump to 3.2 direct care hours effective July 1 under DOH's regs. And I think it's worth um, noting, as the Secretary talked about, these two rate increases that we've had in the past. When you annualize those out, we're at a total of $725 million that have been pushed out in these rates to support the DOH regulations. And that's the that's a total. So the state share of that would be about 326 million. Okay, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. and, and since since you mentioned uh, the feds, how I guess how quickly do they typically act? I know I'm asking you to uh, yeah. uh, have a crystal ball, but how how typically in your that's experience? That's a crystal ball. I don't have. Okay. All right. <laughs> I, they've been. I know they. We had to submit comment a couple months ago, so a month or two ago maybe. So I don't know when they're gonna. Right. And I can't imagine that Pennsylvania is. In a uh, uh, in a unique place as it relates to no. concerns over that, I'm sure uh, I'm they sure heard you from have, you're in every state and territory. Right. Yeah. So uh, finally, if you could just comment on where the department is in the decision making process to allow uh, assisted living services to be eligible for uh, the Medicaid program. Yeah. So we have uh, one managed care organization that is already running a pilot, and a second one that is, uh, I think, in the early stages of standing up that pilot. Uh, this would be uh, under what's called an in lieu of service rather than an individual going to a traditional nursing facility to be an assisted living residence, which is a little bit different uh, than a nursing facility. And so those pilots are underway. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Representative Eckert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, I want to jump back to the change healthcare uh, uh, data breach that we talked a little bit about this morning. Mm -hmm. Um, yesterday you testified in front of the Senate regarding this issue and I think, and, and I know you put a press release out, and I believe the department's position is they didn't have any contracts with, with Change Healthcare? We don't use Change Healthcare to process claims. They're, they're an intermediary and we do not, in our Medicaid fee-for-service program, we don't use them. Our managed care organizations do, So, but we don't. Okay, and, and so, in a quick search under Treasury, um, 
it looks like the department does use them for the pharmacy, uh, for, for the pharmacy um, uh, preferred drug list. I think they sit on one of our advisory committees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, because I have right here, I mean, you, you yeah. definitely contract with them. It, it, I mean, but not to process claims in the Medicaid program. It's and was that different. part of the data breach at all? I mean, has there been any exposure there? No. Okay. I, I'm just just to make sure. sure. Obviously, it's yeah. it's you know that's just want to make sure that that was the case. No problem. Yeah. Um, and sticking with sticking with this, um, in your press release yesterday, we talked about uh, you know n looking at nursing homes because I think uh, my my good friend from Lackawanna talked about hospitals. Nursing homes obviously operate a little little thinner margins. Oh yeah. And. Uh, you know, they deal directly with the MCOs, and I think the press release kind of suggested, well, you guys kind of work it out with the MCOs, we're, we're, and I think there's some concern there. So I've heard from the nursing home facilities um, that there's been some, you know, obviously there's harm caused by, by some of these claim submissions, um, and I believe some of them have actually paid the assessment before the data breach. How are we handling that? Because I, well, I, know, I know you said that no assessments have to be paid now, uh, that there would be kind of a waiver, but what about those? What about those facilities that have already paid that assessment? How you know, how are they going to recoup that? So the that? assessments were due on Friday, um, or this Friday, last Friday. last Friday. Yeah, the assessments were due last Friday. What and and I uh, want to acknowledge, I may not have been completely clear. The assessments will ultimately be due. We're not waiving the assessments. But if someone did not make their payment by last Friday, we are not going to assess any fines or penalties. I certainly hope not. I mean, it's uh, uh, so. What is so? What's the department's plan? Because look, uh, how many nursing homes do we have in uh, in, in Pennsylvania? A lot. I, 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 so, uh, and for each of them to have to contact their respective MCOs. I mean, what is the department's role here to to make sure that we're we, you know, that these nursing facilities can make payroll and provide, you know, services to these uh, individuals. What's, what's the, I know this is very recent, but what is the game plan? I mean, what is DHS really going to do? Because I think just saying, you know, work with your MCO, maybe not, might not be enough. I think, I think DHS might have to get involved uh, and provide some been type of. very actively involved. There are daily phone calls across providers and across our agencies. Uh, Commissioner Humphreys convened a multi-stakeholder call yesterday, so we've been very engaged. In our uh, Community Health Choices program in particular, we have three managed care organizations, VISTA, UPMC, and PHW. Uh, UPMC has not really been experiencing any uh, major problems. They don't, uh, they have very minimal uh, use of change health care, so they're operating pretty much as normal. Uh, VISTA has I believe stood up a, another, they're in the process of setting up another relay through which these claims can be processed. And then um, PHW has also been having a, some problems and is also working and I think actually has already stood up an alternate, alternate vendor. In is the, the department willing to, you know, step in and maybe order some advancements with the MCOs? Oh, I, I, as I mentioned this morning, absolutely. So we are looking at whether or not any advance payments could be released. Um, our team is taking a look at those numbers, both in the physical health and in CHC. Uh, thankfully, our behavioral health providers have been minimally if uh, impacted at all. And uh, it just becomes a question of coming up with an advance payment number and then uh, having that conversation with the governor's budget office to see if literally the cash is available that could be advanced. So that, pro that is a process and we are working through it. So, and, and just, just to circle back real quick on those that have paid their fee assessment already, I, I guess I think mm -hmm. you answered it, but I think the idea is that that fee is always going to be a due at some point here. Mm -hmm. So the folks that have already paid it have paid it, and it and right, there's it's no just one less thing they have to worry about. Understood. But so, the folks that haven't will have to pay it. They just won't be ass uh, assessed any penalties or. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you, Madam Secretary. Yeah. Please do whatever you can to to help our nursing. Yeah, facilities. we're taking it very very seriously. Thank you.